Welcome to tonight's colloquium presentation. I'm Lionel Howard, and I'm the program director for the Cross Research Disparity Team of Education and Equality at the George Washington University here in Washington, DC. So I'd like to welcome all of our, our guests and our two presenters this evening for what I hope is a um, very interesting uh, presentation and perhaps some thoughtfully engaged conversation towards the end. Um, for all of our guests, I'm gonna please request that you um, mute yourselves and um, the chat feature is open. And so you are welcome to um, provide comments throughout the presentation, but certainly when we get to the Q&A section of the presentation, I'll try to monitor and, and um, track uh, the questions that you're presenting to our candidates. I mean, not our candidates, our presenters. I'm making dissertation. <laughs> um, so um, for those of you who are not familiar with the education and inequality concentration of the PhD in education program at George Washington University, um, it is a scholarly community where we investigate the intersections of power race, place, and identity as key areas informing considerations of education and inequality. A central focus is on understanding the intersections of communities, families, schools, service providers, and children as a part of the larger society and world in which they exist. Through our individual and collective scholarly activity, we search for ways to create opportunities for understanding, disrupting, and dismantling systems of oppression that have adversely and disproportionately affected the lives of marginalized, minoritized, migrant, immigrant, and BIPOC student populations. So it is most fitting to learn with and be in conversations with Dr. Sawyer and Rosales this evening. Dr. Sawyer is an assistant professor of teacher education at California State University, Bakersfield where he also directs the liberal studies and bilingual authorization programs. His research explores the nexus of migration and education with a focus on Latinx children, youth, and families. He is also a specialist in the design and study of bilingual education programs and models for place-based and culturally sustaining pedagogies for English, for English learners and other historically minoritized populations especially in rural California. His recent work has been published by International Multilingual Research Journal, the Journal of Latinos in Education, and Teachers Education Quarterly. And he is the co-editor of the 2013 Teachers College Press volume regarding Educación, Mexican-American Schooling, Immigration, Binational Solutions. Previous to his academic career, Adam served as a Spanish bilingual elementary school teacher in California and as an academic consultant to Mexican National Ministry of Education. He holds an EDM and an EDD from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Welcome, Dr. Sawyer. His colleague, Dr. Rosales, is a professor of history and is the faculty director of the Social Justice Institute at Baker Fields College in California. His research focuses on labor and civil rights history in the American West, and he is a contributing author to Beyond Civil Rights, African-American and Latino Latina Activism in the, 20th, in the 20th Century United States, which was published by University of Georgia Press in 2016, and also the Chicano Movement Perspectives from the 21st Century published by Rutledge in 2014. Dr. Rosales is currently residing a book manuscript on multiracial civil rights history in Bakersfield to be published by the University of Texas Press, a past and current grantee of the National Endowment for the Humanities. He currently serves as a board chair for California Humanities. Welcome, Dr. Rosales. In a co-presentation format, Dr. Sawyers and Rollins will present their collaborative National Endowment of the Humanities Funded Project on bringing place-based humanities learnings to life for K-12 teachers through a curated, guided, and firsthand experience within numerous historic and cultural landmarks of the San Joaquin Valley in California. 
connected to themes of multi-ethnic and multi-generational migration and rural agricultural labor, their project focuses on increasing the humanities knowledge and place-based pedagogical methods of K-12 educators, especially those serving rural communities and related to migration and rural agricultural labor. Their project seeks to eliminate the migratory and labor experiences of a multi-generational, multi-ethnic, and multi-racial ensemble of rural Americans, as well as support teachers while teachers in integrating rural historical landmarks into their teaching and curriculum, while considering the ties that bind rural Americans across time, space, and identity. Ultimately, their project seeks to help teachers expand their capacity to create a more perfect union and democratic society through substantive firsthand experiences with iconic rural landmarks and their relevance to K-12 teaching. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome and present Dr. Sawyer and Rosales to our community. Okay, well, thank you so much, Lionel. We really appreciate the invitation and the chance to be with all of you today. And to our audience, we I can already tell we have a nationwide audience because I recognize some of the names of my students out there and um, extra credit rules. And um, I'm just really happy. I know it's a time of semester for all of us, no matter where we are in the educational pipeline, where we're tired and there's a lot to do. So we really appreciate you being here. So good afternoon. Good afternoon, muy buenas tardes a todas y todos. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and move into an overview of our presentation today. So we're gonna start off, Oliver and I are going to start off with just kind of stepping back a little bit into our positionality as academics and what's brought us to this work. We're from different backgrounds, different places, but yet we've converged on the um, many research projects, and in particular, this NEH project that Lionel described for you. We will go into that, and then we will describe the place. It's a place that those of you in the audience from the Southern San Joaquin Valley know quite well. And maybe those of you, for others, it'll be a new um, introduction to the area. So we'll dive into the place and some of the unique facets, the assets, the challenges, and um, paradoxes, and but just overall uniqueness of the Southern San Joaquin Valley, a place that Oliver is from and a place that me as an outsider has come to love. We then from there will present some work from a pilot study that we did. Um, that was one of the steps that led us to the NEH grant. It's with the Delano Oral History Project. So I will share some snippets from that pilot study to give you some background on kind of how we orient ourselves theoretically with this work and some of what we've found so far in terms of the impact of these place-based projects, these critical place-based projects. From there, um, really Oliver will take us through really the landscape of the grant itself, this National Endowment of Humanities grant and the sites we will visit um, and really the structure of the experience. From there, we will discuss some Implications and really next steps are kind of always as academics, always think of that next thing we're going to do from here in terms of impact, both scholarly impact, but also the practitioner impact of this work. And, um, and as Lionel said, we'll go from there, hopefully to a really wonderful conversation with all of you. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, my wonderful colega, Dr. Oliver Rosales from Mitchell College. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Lionel, for the invitation. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So I want to mention uh, a little bit of my own positionality as a historian to this project that's been described to you thus far. Um, I'm a historian at, at Bakersfield College. Adam mentions I'm, uh, I think, a fourth generation Bakersfield native. And, you know, coming up within the educational pipeline, there, there wasn't a lot written about Bakersfield, but there were two main subjects that sort of stood out. Um, one was the history of, of Cesar Chavez. He's fairly well known in the American West and, and also, I think, across the U.S. generally as you know, the most significant labor leader in the history of the Mexican American civil rights movement. Um, folks also tend to know about Buck Owens, the, the famous country singer. Um, so I bring those up because myself coming up as a historian, I 
I, I, and as a student of history, I, I felt somewhat disconnected from place in history. Like, you know, that history was something that always was happening outside of where I would, you know, live my lived environment, so to speak, right? And as I became a historian and, and did the PhD and tried to figure out, you know, how to research and write about history that I was passionate about, I gravitated toward um, trying to tell the story of the California Civil Rights Movement. And, you know, US civil rights history obviously is sort of dominated in many ways by a Southern narrative, you know, MLK, the, the Student Leadership Conference. Um, you know, there's folks who are doing stuff on the Northern struggle for civil rights and overcoming de facto segregation. But as you go out West, the story looks different. It's less sort of black and white. Uh, it's more multiracial. And in California, it's especially connected to the labor movement because the labor movement sort of spawned all of these other social justice uh, and civil rights movements. And so there's people who write about that a little bit. My own work tries to get beyond just the farm worker movement question and the issue of labor rights and wages for farm workers, but tries to look at the ways that, um, you know, the farm worker movement encouraged other manifestations of civil rights, whether it's like school integration or, you know, fighting poverty or you know, integrating the housing market. That's how I'm approaching this larger research question, including the kinds of subjects that students should be learning in school. Uh, could you go to the next slide, Adam? Um, another sort of positionality that I have aside from this, the, the historiography, the scholarship is as a, a public humanities practitioner. Um, Lionel mentioned that I'm currently the board chair for our state humanities council in California. Um, I joined the board mostly because I, to be quite honest with you, I was kind of sick of LA and San Francisco getting all the money. <laughs> so, you know, I've dedicated myself to make sure that um, the Central Valley, the San Joaquin Valley, you know, immigrant communities, migrant communities, multilingual communities have access to, um, especially the federal dollars that the NEH has a budget annually of like somewhere like $180 million, you know, that goes across the US and, and oftentimes that money can be used to leverage other sources. I wanted to make sure that, you know, immigrant communities are having access to these, these funding streams. And so I've done a number of, of grant projects that have focused on immigrant communities. I've lobbied for uh, federal funding for those funds I've also been involved in uh, getting money from the state of California, which was very unique. We hadn't gotten uh, state dollars yet. And um, I note, note the picture at the top uh, with Rob Bonta, who's our current um, state attorney general, who has intimate connections to the story of Delano. He's a Philip, who's the first Filipino American to serve, I believe, in the California Assembly. And he grew up at one of the historic landmark sites that we're going to talk about at La Paz. Um, let's go to the next slide, um, Adam. Um, one other thing about rural humanities I just want to mention, because again, a lot of the project that we're talking about today is funded by the NEH in DC, um, that this is a bipartisan thing. Uh, in the photo on the left, uh, it's David Valadeo. He's our congressman, our current Republican congressman, uh, who's always been very friendly to uh, humanities projects. Um, he's uh, been involved in a really hot contested election with the guy on the right, on the lower, TJ Cox. Uh, they've sort of gone in and out of the same seat for a few years now, and he's a Democrat. And I, I bring it up because this is a nonpartisan thing. Uh, even if my own sort of affinis, affinities are with sort of, you know, social justice and whatnot, um, you know, I recognize that when you're dealing with funding streams, I think this is important from the perspective of advocacy and, and us as educators, that this is really a nonpartisan endeavor. And so, I've always been thankful that we had the support of both Republicans and Democrats uh, in championing uh, humanities funding. And the, the fellow on the top there um, is Ben Allen, who's been our state level champion as well within California for getting um, you know, taxpayer dollars to support rural humanities. Adam, the next slide. I think this is you. Believe it or not, this is me on um, these pictures. Um, Back at a time when the hair was a little darker and a little fuller, and maybe I hadn't discovered the great joys of pozole, pupusas, and other wonderful treats. Um, I, what really where I start with in my work, and certainly all the work I do, including this project, is this background as a second and third grade teacher. Um, these are pictures from a little community of East Palo Alto, California. Not Palo Alto, East Palo Alto, other side of the freeway. Um, it's a small community outside of Palo Alto near San Jose, not far south from San Francisco, that was predominantly 
when I worked there in the 90s, predominantly Mexican immigrant, a Salvadoran immigrant with a longstanding African American um, community as well. Uh, African American community that was reducing in size, similar to the dynamics we see in places like South LA. Um, but I had this work, so I was a Bay Area native. That's where I started off, Giants fan, Niners fan. Um, and came into this work as a young 20 something in East Palo Alto. I was a white Jewish middle-class guy who, you know, I spoke some Spanish, but from a cultural perspective, I was really different. I really was coming as an outsider of the communities I worked in East Palo Alto, communities in San Francisco and LA. And really as many practitioners have to do in a teaching in terms of having an environment that is truly culturally sustaining, there was so much to learn and unlearn, probably most importantly, in connecting and engaging in the families in meaningful ways. Well, this work has set the basis. It inspired me from everything I've done since. Um, it would inspired me kind of at the tail end of my teaching career before graduate school to go, I was able to get a position, kind of a side position with the Mexican Ministry of Education. I was placed in six states of high migration to the US. This was kind of an attempt on my part to really get a deeper sense of the international dimensions of migration and sort of international dimensions of schooling and how institutional and cultural contexts can um, overlap but diverge. And it was really my way of becoming a better, a better scholar and better educator in the population I had been committed to. Um, from 2004 to 2010, like many of you, I was um, in grad school. Six years, you don't get those years back, but they do pay off. Um, and from grad school, really my first stop after grad school was coming back to California, but to a different, to the other California. I came from coastal California and, and then I moved to the Central Valley. I had a job in Delano at the Bard College Master of Arts and Teaching Program that was on the site of Delano. That's where I met Oliver and I met. And um, we co-taught courses on history education for future teachers. But really, is Oliver is somebody from the Valley and I'm somebody from outside the Valley. When you're not from the Valley, you really are not from the Valley. And there's, and, and once again, there's that process of learning these new spaces and places, um, things I was inspired by from the outside, such as the farm workers movement, but also learning that contemporary reality in ways and new ways of being. Um, so that was the period from 09 to 18, that first period of this. And then I've taken this position at Cal State Bakersfield from 2018 to the present day as Director of Liberal Studies and the coordinator of the Bilingual Authorization. My research is really connected to Latinx education, bilingual ed, culturally responsive and culturally sustaining pedagogies. That's what really drives my work around equity, around social justice. So this place, I gave you a little sense that um, I have a lot of my students here today. I'm thrilled by that. And what is this place of the Southern San Joaquin Valley? Well, it's the valley is this kind of heart, we would say, of California. And where we are in the Southern San Joaquin is this bottom portion. This is to kind of differentiate it from the coastal California, perhaps the glamour, glitz, and profile of places Hollywood, LA, um, the Bay Area. Gerald Haslam, a writer who, who wrote extensively about the Valley termed it the other California. And it really is a unique and distinctive place and one worthy of attention and certainly in our equity work. It is a place of immense historical and literary legacies for one, right? If we think back to, the, to John Steinbeck and the Jodes, the Jodes went over the mountain into the promise of California. When they came over the mountain, it was into the Southern San Joaquin Valley, just south of Bakersfield, right? It's been memorialized and chronicled in literature, um, so tied into that Dust Bowl migration. Of course, many of us have been raised knowing about the UFW 1965 grape strike, which is one that really captured, um, that inspired activists around the country. And certainly somebody like me who grew up with you know, I grew up in Berkeley, so you imagine the leanings of my parents, right? It certainly was a movement that inspired us. It is a place incredibly rich in cultural and linguistic diversity owing to this migration that has been tied to this history 
of agriculture, right? And certainly the Latinx population is a very, very significant population for us. Over 60% of, of our student population at Cal State Bakersfield, we have school districts that are more than 95% Latinx. So really a lot of the future of Latinx California is right here in this valley. Um, the Central Valley is really breadbasket to the nation and world. Um, two fifths of the nation's food supply comes from this valley. Um, so that importance in the US economy and food supply is immense. But paradoxically, right, you think about these assets, you think about this abundance, it is also a place with very high levels of poverty, right? Numbers we see on par with Appalachia and certainly the area of most in poverty in, in the California context. Also paradoxically, right, in a place that feeds so much of the nation and the world, it's a place of food deserts and childhood hunger. And certainly education and health disparities, everything ranging from high school graduation, suspension and expulsion rates, health disparities such as that of rates of asthma and other, ma other maladies that really break down along the lines of race and class. There's also one for those of us concerned, right, with culturally responsive, culturally sustaining pedagogies, critical pedagogies. It is one that has been historically a subtractive schooling context um, in which you will see some of, the, some of the data of our pilot study in which there has been limited teaching of the farm workers movement in local schools. That really owes to some of the historical dimensions that Oliver will go into now. Yeah, so Adam uh, mentioned he's at CSU Bakersfield and that the history of the farm workers movement hasn't been taught. And I wanted to share this as a sort of anecdote example illustrating that those structural barriers. So a few years ago, I was communicating with John Butler, who's an emeritus professor at Yale and the former president of the Organization of American Historians. And I was on a committee with him and we sort of were chatting it up because his first job was at Cal State Bakersfield where Adam teaches when it opened in 1970. And so John wrote to me, he said, you know, CSU Bakersfield opened in 1970 and I came in 1971 and we, the faculty, were quickly instructed never cap <laughs> to mention the grape workers or Cesar Chavez because reputedly the de Giorgio farm family was very supportive of CSU Bakersfield and the then president Philip Wilder who left to became president of Hartwick College in upstate New York glowered at any mention of Chavez end quote and so I bring that up because you know by, by 1970-71 Cesar Chavez had been on the cover of Time magazine he had already signed the first contracts uh, for farm workers in the history of the U.S. so he was widely widely noted and, and respected through both the grape strike and the boycott nationally and internationally, yet at the only institution of education that offered um, a BA, right, in higher education and teacher training, you, you, you couldn't engage the topic administratively. Let's go to the next slide, Adam. So a couple of other quick things I just want to cruise through to orient you to the history of the region and the contemporary reality of segregation within the region, which is a backdrop for our grant. Um, these are some 2020 sort of census um, between 2010 and 2020 data, um, this showing you racial segregation within the region, uh, the green uh, being the Hispanic population and the brown uh, being the essentially the white population. And so what you'll see is that the sort of southeast part of the city of Bakersfield on the other side of the Southern Pacific Railroad tracks is sort of historically where Hispanics have been located. Um, and then the northwest uh, portion of the city uh, has, is sort of historically where the white population has been uh, located, particularly uh, after the civil rights movement when there was a lot of white flight uh, as the local city school district became uh, racially integrated. And as you move into the rural peripheries uh, to the north into these small agricultural communities like Delano or McFarland, if you've seen McFarland USA with the Disney movie with Kevin Costner, these are basically, you know, anywhere between 80 to 100% uh, Hispanic Mexican. Next slide, Adam. This is another visualization of that racial segregation. So in, in this case, the purple dots are the densities of the Hispanic populations on the east side and the southeast part of the city. And in the, the northwestern parts of the city, it's more uh, blue, which is the white population. Although, as you see, there are some certainly some sprinklings in and Hispanic migration into the west, which is causing great fear <laughs> among some of the white population. Um, and if you were to zoom out at a sort of macro level of the valley, it's basically going to be almost entirely uh, purple with, uh, you know, dominated uh, uh, Hispanic populations. Good. Next slide, Adam. Um, there's a couple other indicators just to show you it's not just about race here. This is a, a language 
um, chart, again, showing you the, the prevalence of basically Spanish uh, in the uh, southeastern part of the city uh, with English in the northeastern part of the city. Uh, next slide, Adam. This is another one showing you not language, but um, income. And so in the green, this would be the white population. Uh, the median income is above, you know, uh, what, $60,000, $70,000. And in the southeastern part of the city, um, it's below $30,000. Um, next one, Adam. Um, beyond census, there's a couple of artifacts of segregation in the region I wanted to share. Uh, on the right-hand side, it's a, um, uh, a sign on the roadside from 1946 in Bakersfield uh, saying no colored trade solicited here. So in parts of California, you certainly had a kind of de facto uh, segregation within places of public accommodation. Um, on the left, uh, this is from the Bakersfield Californian, which is the kind of main newspaper within the city of Bakersfield. This is around 1911. Might be difficult to read, but the Eagles Club was a very prominent fraternal organization in town. They, have, they still have a club there today. And if you zone in on the green box section, it says that they were having a community celebration where among other things, you know, besides getting your hot dog, you could play the quote, hit the N word, end quote. And so this is a sort of, you know, popular um, game that was sort of played within Jim Crow America. And Bakersfield, uh, being a multiracial place, uh, was populated uh, along with other places in the San Joaquin Valley with ex-Confederates that, <laughs> that after the Civil War had moved out to Central California and brought with them uh, their racial views. Uh, next slide, Adam. Uh, this is another artifact of segregation. This would be uh, in the southeastern part of the city over on, on Niles Road. Um, you see here an advertisement for a colored preferred uh, uh, housing. Uh, next one, Adam. Uh, this is super exciting. This is not an artifact, but this is a, a current educational project that's happening also at CC Bakersfield. So some of you in DC might be familiar with uh, redlining maps. So, um, you know, in American cities like DC or Detroit or, you know, Los Angeles, um, the Federal Housing Administration in the 1930s um, redlined um, loans, right, for um, subsidized housing, right? So a lot of white families could get really low interest loans to stay in their homes during the economic crisis of the 30s, and that helped white families build uh, equity, right? Black folks especially were excluded from those uh, low, ad low interest loans, and so they, they, they didn't build up that capital. And the government uh, manufactured these maps so bankers kind of knew like where the black populations were so they could exclude them from that. Now that also went down in Bakersfield, but there was, there's no map, there's no historic map for Bakersfield because uh, those maps, um, the federal the FHA maps were only for cities of greater than 50,000. And so some uh, students, uh, folks in the master's program have gone into the hall of records in Bakersfield and started to map out through um, housing deeds which particular neighborhoods were racially restricted. And so that's another super, super exciting project that's, that's going on. Uh, next slide, Adam. I think this is you now. All right, thank you, Oliver. So I mentioned back at the positionality slide that um, Oliver and I met right on the site in Delano, working training teachers basically in history pedagogy. Um, we got to co-teach a course. I took the pedagogy side, Oliver was the historian in the room. And through that collaboration, I think one thing that really jumped out at me when I first came to Delano um, with a perspective that was more coastal was the, was when I got to Delano, I was like, hey, where's, where are all the monuments to Cesar Chavez? And I would ask locals and sometimes you're met with dead silence. And sometimes <laughs> there's a little, there's awkward, there's awkwardness sometimes that was completely unexpected for me as an outsider and one I had to kind of slowly deconstruct um, from, from that perspective. Oliver and I got together um, in our conversations. I did learn about work, though, he was doing in his other role at Bakersfield College to have students take oral histories of the farm workers movement, interviewing um, community members, interviewing um, family members who were involved at that time. Well, to make a long story short, it all came out in this article from 2019, the Journal of Latinos in Education. Um, we'll put a link in the chat later, but this is really um, where we put down some findings from a pilot study. What that pilot study referred to was this Delano Oral History Project. Um, Here's a couple more um, historical, it was a historical image and a contemporary image for you to think about kind of some of these um, 
really extremes you have in a place like Delano. And I know I have several Delano natives here from um, my student body as well. Um, one would be an image from the 60s, right around the time of the grape strike where you see Cesar Chavez, um, Larry Itliang, the great um, Filipino leader of the movement, the signs representing the different unions, right? This historical footage of a very, in, in many ways, in terms of civil rights history, a very inspirational moment um, in the history of California and the nation. On the right, though, is something that represents kind of one of the big growth industries in the region is that of prisons, right? And just down Cecil Drive, the main drive, main drag of um, Delano, really close to the Bakersfield, the, the Delano branch of Bakersfield College, are two state prisons that are right across from one another. That really is also part of this sociocultural landscape and certainly the economic landscape of the region in the present day. So to give you a sense of this pilot that got us going here and laid some more of that foundation towards the NEH grant, the Delano Oral History Project was one in which students interviewed family or community members about the farm workers movement. Um, these interviews, and this was of interest to me as a multi, somebody who's a multilingual educator, these were in English, Spanish, Tagalog, um, a, a Filipino language, and translanguaging, right, which is kind of the switching of education, of, of linguistic registers. Um, some might think about this as Spanglish, for example, a mixing of um, registers within a language or different languages altogether. Um, we did primary, there was primary and secondary source analysis on the part of students, student historical writing, and student reflective writing. Hector, to Oliver, I was about to call, I was calling <laughs> Oliver the name of my son right here, but Oliver is an amazing history teacher. This was a joy to watch. From the research perspective, we, um, Oliver did instructors field notes. We had a student background questionnaire. We also conducted focus groups, interviews, transcriptions, and coding. And then we, from there, did trans transcription and coding, as well as examination of student work. Um, the research questions that guided this part of the work was what was the impact, right? This experience of collecting oral histories on the farm workers movement, what was the impact of this project on student historical thinking skills? What was the impact on student perceptions of home culture and community cultural wealth, student future aspirations? And finally, um, I put this in parentheses because this is something that emerged in our data analysis and that was not necessarily something we were looking at at first, was the student use and valuing of linguistic resources. Um, so let me get into here the, the theoretical um, frames that guided our work and I think can really do lay at the heart of what we are doing with this work of working with teachers, bringing teachers to the San Joaquin Valley for place-based learning experiences. Um, in 2003, a scholar from Washington State named David Grunewald proposed this idea of critical pedagogy of place. Well, up to this moment, pedagogy of place, or it's also known as place-based education, had really been one, a, a term really tied to environmental education and the study of outdoor spaces. What Grunewald saw was this ability to think about this in terms of places of social and historical significance. How might students utilize the local context and local knowledge to both access deep content area concepts and learning, right? We know those of you who have been teachers know about Common Core, right? And this importance of depth of knowledge, content area learning. Well, there's that part of it, but there's also this part of it that really ties in to more traditions tied to critical pedagogy um, and other traditions, emancipatory notions of instruction. And that critical pedagogy of place could also be a, a basis for service and social action, decolonization and re-inhabitation of space and place. Right, if you're thinking about a place like Delano that really we could say is the Selma of California in terms of its significance to the Latinx um, and Filipino civil rights movements, um, the fact that these places are not, have, have been kind of left aside and not taught also lends itself to a reclamation, a decolonization and re-inhabitation of that space and place. 
Critical pedagogy of place also seeks to connect social justice to that of ecological justice, which is a whole other thing that certainly is one worth examining in the Southern San Joaquin Valley. Other conceptual frameworks that, that really provide some of the intellectual foundation of our work is, go, is the utilization of student and family funds of knowledge, right? Tracing back to Gonzalez's and Moll's classic work, the building of bicultural competence that is talked a lot in the, in the, in the literatures on culturally responsive, culturally sustained pedagogies. We can trace back to Gloria Ladson Billings, there's a Django Paris. Um, also this development of social critique skills or critical consciousness, right? Makes us think back to the work of Palo, classic work of Paolo Freire and certainly in some of the ways that Ladson Billings built upon that decades later. The third, notions of a third space that Chris Gutierrez um, really brought to our attention. This idea of spaces and places are not necessarily always what they are today. There's this possibility of what they might be tomorrow in some imagined future. And that is also part of this in a context where inequality, where there, with such great inequality and disparities like the Central Valley, but yet with so much cultural, linguistic, literary wealth. Um, and speaking of wealth, certainly Tara Yasso's classic work on community cultural wealth informs this. How do we detect that the wealth of one's community, the one that has been perhaps not, not, not shared, hidden from view, but now can be reclaimed? Um, our students in this sample, anybody who knows Delano, um, there were 49 students, but anybody who knows Delano knows that our demographic here, what we captured here is very, captures really how Delano looks, right? It's 60% Latinx, 20% Filipino, 9% white, 5% multi-ethnic. Delano is one of the most diverse cities um, in the Central Valley, and this is very similar to the, the, the population as a whole. Um, most of our students were second generation immigrants, the children of immigrants with 70, um, that's 73 percent of the populate of, of, the, of the group here, with most having background in Mexico, but Philippines and Guatemala were also included. We also had about a quarter of our sample was foreign born from Mexico um, in the Philippines. And this second generation number is very much in line with what we see in the valley. So many of my first generation college students here at CSUB, including many who are in this virtual space with us today, are the children of immigrants. Um, in terms of home languages other than English, that was about 70% of the sample, with Spanish being the largest number, but also different Filipino languages, Tagalog, Ilocano, Pangalaba, all represented uh, within our student sample. Um, and near about 43% were classified as English learner during their K-12 schooling, just another part of this linguistic diversity. Okay, now this gets pretty interesting too in thinking about who these 49 students from the, from the Bakersfield College Delano campus were. Kind of in line with the agricultural basis of the economy, um, the recent experiences with immigration, 26 of those 49 had at some point in their lives worked in farm labor, right? And that's a very common story with many of our first generation college students, both at Bakersfield College and Cal State Bakersfield. Um, 22 of them have at least one parent who still or currently works in farm labor. Now, this one's a big one, and this goes back to that letter that Oliver shared earlier and some of that, those impressions I had as an outsider coming to the Valley of, you know, we know the song about Bruno, right? But I got the sense that we don't talk about Cesar Chavez or Dolores Huerta when he came to the Central Valley in some spaces, right? And certainly some spaces in Delano. Only eight of our students of this 49 had received any instruction on the farm workers movement during their K to 12 education. You know, and Cal anybody from California knows our whole fourth grade social studies curriculum is devoted to California. So it's pretty amazing that, it was, that even a cursory um, introduction to the topic wouldn't have been brought in. Um, and lastly, 33 of the 49 were the first in their family to attend college, which is very similar to our demographic in both the community college space at Bakersfield College and the four-year university, Cal State Bakersfield. Okay, 
what did we find from this pilot and why does it matter in terms of the place-based work we will be doing with this NEH grant? We found really strong engagement with history and historical thinking through these primary sources. If you think about it, these primary sources for students were these oral histories conducted in really meaningful ways with members of the community or family members over over a piece of local history, very, very um, significant local history, right? You make it, you make it relevant, and there's going to be engagement. Um, the connection with the home culture, the fact that so many of these interviews were conducted with family members, right? Was that idea of that being another connection and appreciation of one's home culture within a context we know that has been decidedly subtractive of excitement to me as a bilingual, multilingual educator, is this meaningful utilization of L1 or home language skills and translanguaging. In order to conduct these interviews, students had to rely on their full linguistic repertoires, right? And seeing that value of that language that may have been dormant in terms of least formal schooling, but then it used in a very meaningful way with schooling here. Um, empathy for the farm workers and undocumented, um, transnational awareness, given that many of the interview subjects had lived in different national spaces over time or the course of their lives, and really crucially, this importance of Delano in U.S. history. Um, I have, there's so much wonderful data from these interviews. I'm going to be able to share one with you today because just for purposes of time, um, this is Yesenia. Um, was one of the students who participated in this project and Delano. And she's a 21-year-old, or at the time was a 21-year-old Mexican-American young woman. Both of her parents were born in Mexico. Um, she was born and raised in Delano, so second-generation immigrant background, plans to become a school counselor. She had a fascinating um, oral history project because she interviewed her octogenarian grandfather, who was living now living in Mexico um, and who was a farm worker, but and also a close collaborator, it turned out, with Cesar Chavez. So just really fascinating um, her background and what led to her interviews. So in the interviews, we asked about what, stu what these students saw as the lasting impact of this place-based education experience, this oral history experience, learning about the farm workers movement. Here's what Yesenia had to say. Before doing this project, I really did not know very much about the farm workers movement. I knew that my grandfather had been vaguely involved in some way, but he was stern and quiet and then moved to Mexico. So I never had to ch a chance to speak with him about it. When I interviewed him, you know, in my broken Spanish and Spanglish, his eyes lit up and he took out all these pictures of the organizing and the strike. I began to feel deep inside what it may have been like to be alive at that time. I just feel like I really come from something now. I'm just gonna let us sit with that one for a second here. And so, the one thing that being jumped out to Oliver and I in the analysis in terms of us being both history educators, right, and social science educators is just this sense of what we call in the field historical empathy, right? I began to feel deep inside what it may have been like to be alive at that time. Well, that is rich, right, when you get to that point of that connection to history. And on other levels here, right, um, this connection with her grandfather who was kind of a distant figure in her life. She did not have this deep connection with him and, and really find out what, how amazing he was, right? And being able to have this meaningful engagement with him and kind of long dormant in terms of academically speaking language skills, right? Using that full linguistic repertoire, they're all assets, right? Even if that Spanish is not the King's Spanish, that's okay because it allows communication, right? That she was able to make that connection with him and, um, and then this community cultural wealth, right? Or even this sense of wh where she's from and what might be possible, right? I just feel like I really come from something now, right? And um, the Central Valley can be very maligned, right? In the California narrative, when you go to other parts of California and certainly 
we don't celebrate these spaces the way we can, but this was a moment of celebration for Yesenia. Um, I'm going to move forward here to the grant now and turn it over to Oliver. And I encourage you to read our paper to get some of these other testimonies from students. Yeah, I'll just give a quick overview of what the grant is. I've already mentioned this is funded by the NEH, but in 2023, we'll be able to use the funding, $190,000, to provide a professional development experience for teachers from across the U.S. to come to the San Joaquin Valley to be in residency at CSU Bakersfield for one week in two different week sessions. And they'll get to visit um, four historic landmarks that we'll show you really quickly. And they get a chance to um, interact with visiting scholars, um, cultural interpreters, and also have a, a sort of university setting with seminars with Adam and myself, and again, visiting scholars. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Adam. So this is a brief abstract of it. I just wanted to read this to you to kind of crystallize uh, what the project is. It says, from the exhausted hope of the Jodes to the tenacity of Cesar Chavez, from the austere Garvian self-reliance of Allensworth to the lyricism of the Bakersfield sound, very few locales have captured the promise, struggles, artistry, and multi-ethnic tapestry of rural America more than California's San Joaquin Valley. This place-based work, place workshop features four historic rural landmarks related to multiracial agricultural settlement since the late 19th century through the era of the farm worker movement in the 1960s. Participant field trips will include cultural heritage interpreters, visiting scholars, and companion digital archive material related to Allensworth State Park, Sunset Labor Camp, National Chavez Center, and various historical landmarks located in Delano, California. Hosted by CSU Bakersfield, participants will draw linkages to K-12 curriculum with a focus on teaching the rich and diverse history of migration and agricultural labor in the United States. Now juxtapose that with what the Dean said. <laughs> Next slide, Adam. <laughs> Um, these are the landmark sites. So here you see Bakersfield right in the middle. Um, to the north, you have Allensworth, which is the only state historic park in California that is sort of dedicated to uh, African-American uh, history. Uh, it was a sort of independent site set up by Black people for Black people um, in, in that kind of uh, United Negro Improvement Association Garvian fashion that I was describing in the abstract. Um, and again, a lot of African-Americans after the Civil War went west trying to escape Jim Crow and uh, one of the places that they settled uh, was Allensworth. And it's, uh, you know, if you go to Allensworth today uh, in the month of February, you're going to see Black folks from all across the West that go. It's really this kind of diasporic place for African Americans in the West. Uh, south of that, you have Delano, this is about 10 miles. The number of historic landmarks there uh, associated with the farm worker movement. Um, in um, this, uh, so I guess it would be the Southeast uh, of Bakersfield in Lamont, you have there. The, um, the 48, or not 40 acres, but the, um, uh, the Sunset Labor Camp. This is the setting for the Grapes of Wrath, uh, John Steinbeck's book. And east toward Keene, California in the mountains, uh, this became the institutional home of the United Farm Workers uh, after they sort of, um, they didn't leave Delano, but they, because of the assassination attempts on Cesar Chavez's life, um, you know, uh, Kennedy was killed in 68. The brother who was a big supporter of the UFW, um, you know, Malcolm X, Martin King, um, uh, you know, Cesar also had threats on his life. And so there was concern. And so we'll show some pics of what that place looks like as well. Um, next slide, Adam. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, this is Watts, California in the summer, you know, just a few years after the riots uh, in the mid 60s. And uh, Watts was having, you know, obviously it has a historic black population and they were having a cultural celebration where among other folks, representatives from Allensworth uh, went uh, to celebrate and promote their city. And I just wanted to underscore the title of their, their, um, their, their car advertisement, right? Allensworth, City of Black Hope. Um, and in the 1970s, there was a, a real struggle uh, to get the state of California to recognize um, Allensworth as a, a state historic park. And so uh, we pay homage and respect to, um, you know, those public history practitioners who led that struggle. Um, next uh, slide, Adam. This is the um, Arvin Federal Camp in the mid 1930s. Uh, again, the setting of the Grapes of Wrath. Um, interestingly enough, the uh, man who ran this at one point uh, Fred Ross um, was the mentor of uh, Cesar Chavez. Uh, Fred Ross was a product of um, Saul Alinsky and the kind of back, back of the yards 
uh, community organizing tradition out of Chicago. Uh, and he came out west to organize uh, Mexican farm workers, essentially. And his most famous protege was, was Cesar Chavez. And one of the things that this grant tries to do is to find common ground between these multiracial, multi, um, you know, ethnic migrant communities across time and place. Um, next slide, Adam. Uh, this is a mural in downtown Delano today, uh, commemorating the history of Delano, among other things, the farm worker movement. And I, I showed this because it, it has you know, three figures, um, Caesar obviously in the middle, uh, but you also have um, uh, Larry Itliang to the right in the glasses. Uh, he was the founder of AWOC, which was the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, which is a predominantly Filipino American labor union, along with Philip Veracruz, another important uh, Filipino organizer. And when they, they merged the, the two unions together, they became the United Farm Workers. And so uh, oftentimes when folks think of the United Farm Workers, they just think of, uh, of Mexicans and they don't um, know or they don't realize, they don't uh, understand that the Filipinos played an incredibly uh, important role in the building of that movement. Uh, next slide, Adam. Um, these are uh, actually a historic photo from 1966. It's actually probably never been seen by anybody before in the American public. Uh, it's part of a um, photo collection at CSU Northridge by a freelance photographer named Emin Clark um, that's actually being digitized and, and made available to the public soon through a, a different NEH grant. And I, I wanted to share this because it also captures the imaginations of Mexican people in particular in Delano in the 1960s with the, the sort of political genealogy of Cesar Chavez, right? Drawing a line with Benito Juarez and Emiliano Zapata, sort of, um, you know, folk heroes, political leaders of the, the 19th century and then the early 20th century um, in, in sort of indigenous Mexican revolutionary thinking. Uh, next slide, Adam. This is also another uh, slide uh, that I really, really like. Um, this is a young white female who came to Delano. Um, she, her mother, as I recall, worked in the uh, medical office for farm workers that was set up. Uh, her family was San Francisco. Uh, and like Adam, right, there was a, a huge interest in folks in the Bay Area in coming to Delano uh, to support the Welga or the strike. Uh, and El Macriada was the newspaper that was a sort of companion piece to the farm worker movement. Uh, next slide, Adam. Um, it's not just history. I also want to note that uh, the Filipino American community in Delano is very active now in uh, celebrating not only their contributions to the farm worker movement, but really uh, the position of Delano within a sort of transnational Filipino diaspora. You know, the Filipino migrant community, uh, which was tied to the fishing industry in Alaska, Seattle, Yuba, down in California with agriculture and asparagus. Uh, and including in Delano. So the Filipinos really have taught me as in some ways of uh, who can be a parochial historian to, to understand the, the significance of transnationalism as a sort of analytical framework. And they do a wonderful job with that. Uh, next slide. Um, this is Adam here in the middle a few years ago. Uh, he's talking to uh, Cesar Chavez's grandson, who's the, um, the current director of the um, Cesar Chavez Foundation. And the students there are from Bard College and they were touring uh, the historic 40 acres. And this is the uh, headquarters of the farm worker movement. If you can hear my children in the background, I apologize, they're having a good time. Um, but they're here at Ruther Hall. This is the location where the first farm labor contracts were signed uh, in 1970. Uh, Walter Ruther was the, um, the president of the United Auto Workers, which gave critical financial support to the farm workers when they were off the jobs on strike. Uh, next slide, Adam. Uh, this is a, a really great special event in 2012. You can see President Barack Obama there at the, the sort of pulpit uh, speaking to thousands of people at uh, La Paz, which is the National Chavez Center now where Cesar Chavez is buried. So I mentioned earlier that um, there were a lot of death threats on, on Chavez in the late 60s and early 70s. And uh, a Hollywood filmmaker actually um, purchased uh, the, this property, which is old sort of sanitarium for tuberculosis for um, uh, the, the, the farm workers to have a kind of home that was apart, apart from Delano, it, it's the, the air quality is better, the weather's better, and it's, and it's just safer in that you can sort of monitor who goes in and out. And uh, Ch uh, Obama came in 2012 and made this a historic landmark. And so we use this whole landmarks idea um, you know, to guide our grant project. Uh, next slide, Adam. Uh, I think we have time just to play this. This is a 60 second clip of, uh, of the National Center at La Paz. I'm not sure if you have to share your sound, Adam. 398th unit of the National Park Service. So Mark, how did Cesar's experiences? Abuse, 
define and shape his aspirations for his movement and his people. Caesar used to say that his job as an organizer was to help ordinary people do extraordinary things. He would convince everyone in the movement that the jobs that they had were vitally important. The boycott allowed the farm workers to switch the scene of battle from the fields and vineyards where the odds were stacked heavily against them to the cities where the farm workers had a chance. So, so that film that Adam was playing is a sort of partnership that we did recently well, welcome with the Cesar to the Chavez Foundation. Uh, and, and the students there were touring the site with Mark Grossman, who was the former speechwriter for Cesar Chavez. And for a number of years, Adam and I have uh, worked with Mark in doing these sort of historic tours ad hoc. And so we're super excited to have some major funding <laughs> to actually expand that. Um, this is a sample of the, uh, the program of study. So when we get the, the teacher cohorts to actually come to the Valley and be in residency, this is what a typical day uh, is sort of look like uh, programmatically. So, you know, they'll have guiding questions. Uh, we'll create um, modules through Canvas. Uh, providing uh, open access sources so they can kind of read and prepare and be aware of the scholarship that's out there on these particular places that a lot of folks, a lot of teachers especially, ha hasn't been curated, right? Let's go to the next slide, Adam. And so, uh, you know, basically over the course of a week, this is what a typical day would look like. You know, in the morning, we're going to be taking buses out to these sites, meeting with the cultural interpreters, having that sort of hands-on experience, eating good food, and then we retreat in the afternoon back to CSUB to have the kind of seminar experience, talk about the readings, talk about the, the field experiences. And it's not only um, in person, but through using uh, a learning management system, we'll be able to have a kind of virtual engagement with the teachers along the way. Um, next slide, Adam. So I was just going to chime in on this point that this is going to be in the summer of 2023. And I know that there are maybe some current and certainly aspiring teachers in the room. So we welcome applications that applications will open in November. Um, and we will love, we will really welcome that involvement nationally. And I, and one thing that's wonderful here is that we will have these place-based experiences and Oliver mentioned, there'll be this time later to think about this application to practice. Um, at, um, participants will be in small groups and they will work with a seasoned teacher educator or local educational experts and visiting scholars to think about this application at the K-12 classroom. Yeah, and to reiterate, it's fully funded. That's that we're so excited yes. to provide a paid professional development experience for teachers and as you say, aspiring teachers as well. Yeah, and Bakersfield's beautiful in the summer. Um, we'll have lots of water. It's hot, so we'll, but we have lot, we'll have lots of water. We'll summer. make sure there's access to the swimming pool. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So kind of extending this work, right? Um, we're already thinking about some of these next steps and we're already working on an IRB for when we have the participants come with us for the summer is really to think about what is this going to be, like from our vantage point, this impact on teachers. We saw a little bit of the impact on students when we had the pilot project. Well, what's this impact on teachers, both from the Valley, but maybe from another outs outside places where there could be marginalized experiences, marginalized places, and what would, what's that impact on perception, but also future practice? Um, there's a book project, that this is stemming into. Um, we kind of workshop the name a little bit for the title of this talk. Um, it's Reclaiming Space and Place in a Bilingual Bicultural Future in California's Breadbasket, but really juxtaposing this work with um, what we gain from this, these place-based experiences, with other ways that reclamation is happening in the Valley. Um, there's an explosion, for example, a renaissance in bilingual education, which I've been involved with locally, that is, is really interesting, it's very exciting, right? And it, it's really interesting, I'd like to see how education is playing this role in transforming um, a, the, the, uh, the sociocultural context, right? And the marginalization that has happened traditionally there. Oliver, do you wanna say something about these other projects? Yeah, I've been doing the past year um, GIS surveying with my own students where I'll design a survey that they can take online where they'll basically curate uh, for me historical artifacts within their homes 
um, as well as uh, their migratory patterns. And then I can sort of visualize this geospatially and the students are always sort of amazed to kind of see their own family histories represented with interactive maps. So I've been doing that within my own pedagogy, but I've also leveraged that along with this grant project to go after other funding streams that can kind of expand the GIS, the geospatial uh, work. Uh, and I think, you know, there, there's, there's, it's a huge frontier digital humanities. And so I'm super excited to be going into that the next couple of years, in addition to this uh, place-based learning thing that we've been talking about today. So Lionel will be relieved. This is our last slide, because I know we're tad over time. Um, but I wanted to leave you with this quote from David Grunewald, who uh, proposed this idea of critical pedagogy of place and really thinking about ourselves as educators, maybe future teachers, scholars, um, future academics. Um, it is not necessary to replace all of conventional education with critical place-based pedagogy. The question is, will we embrace place at all? What happened here? What will happen here as a critical construct in educational theory research and practice. Thank you very much. We look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Oliver, for that, um, that presentation. You've given me and I imagine our guests as well so much to, uh, to think about.